Hey guys, we are live. This is the Shooter's Mindset. We are here live with episode 337 with Prentice Wink. We have our co-host of the hour, two co-hosts this week, actually. Greg Cannon, how's it going? Hey, everyone. And Paul McCoy. How's it going, Paul? Good. Glad to be here again. I think you go way back with our guest this week. So our guest of the hour <laughs> is Prentice Wink. How's it going, Prentice? Well, it's good. I, I figure I've probably known Paul for six or seven years, about as yeah. long as I've been shooting PRS. Yeah, I was going to ask you, when when was y'all's first match down there? Because I know I was probably there, but I, I, I on that property, the, I don't remember. That first match on that property was 2011 or 2012, and I came in, in sometime in 13 or 14. Yeah, I know um, I was probably there the first first or second match they ever had there, and it's it's probably one of the most challenging places to shoot I've ever been. It's it's certainly one of the more challenging places to shoot. Um, that is the place that I had to hold five mils at a thousand yards one that's, one summer. That's not common, but it happens. Yes, all the mills. So, Prentice is like our number one fan of the shooter's mindset. Isn't that right, Prentice? Uh, I don't, I don't know about fan or uh, commenter, but yes, I I do watch pretty much every week and try to be engaged in the in whoever y'all are interviewing and try to learn from what they're saying. Do you really you know? or do you just pay more social comment? I like Greg to have to work through comments to find actual comments. So I know y'all get paid an abundant amount of money for this. That's true. It took weeks to negotiate my contract. <laughs> Literally nothing. <laughs> so if we have, hey, I mean, we'll give you a 5% raise. 5% of nothing. Oh, still nothing. Still nothing. Man, you're a COO. That's what I get too. Anyway. So um, if we have 120 comments, I guarantee you that at least 50 of them are Prentice. So that's every week, right? I'm saying hi to other people that are watching and saying hi to you and Greg. And now I'll be starting to say hi to Paul. Wait till he starts tagging you, Paul. You'll be on the show and your phone will be blowing up. Like you might discreetly have your phone in your lap or something and think nothing. And it just starts going off and won't stop. And it's Prentice. So yeah, I, I was people, on. The, I know people. He does that too. Um, we we have some common mutual friends up in the North Texas area. He's famous for doing that. Too. I'm gonna say, yeah. Prentice, Prentice is the best of like when I'm sitting there in a meeting with nothing but people two to three levels above me. That's when he calls me. Like every time. Like, and, and it's always a great conversation that happens like an hour later. But it's like I'm sitting here like. You know, talking about like, hey, you know, we need to spend this much money and this is why. And, you know, listen to what I'm saying. And all of a sudden it's apprentice wink every time. <laughs> it never fails. Well, apprentice, for those that don't know you and don't have the pleasure of having their phones blown up by you. What do you do besides for comments on the shooter's mindset? <laughs> tell us a little bit about yourself <clears throat> and tell us how you got involved in precision rifle shooting. So... I actually work in the oil field as a corrosion technologist that I try to prevent pipelines from rusting through cathodic protection and coating applications. I am one of the owners of Texas Precision Matches. We host 22 and center fire matches throughout the year. Um, probably six or seven years ago now, I had a mutual friend from a local gun shop that said, hey, you should come out and shoot this match. I've got a loaner 308. It'll be fun. Cost you 50 bucks. We'll just go and have a good time. And I did. I showed up. No dope. U.S. optics, old front parallax adjust scope in mill or in MOA. Everybody's calling mills, and I don't know what they're talking about. And I hit four targets. Had an absolute blast, though. So back then, they were running matches every quarter. So decided to go back the next time they had a match. 
and I got seven targets. And after that, I decided, all right, well, I've got three months to build a gun. And that was way before pre-fits and you could just, you know, call Paul McCoy or call whoever and order a custom rifle and have it shipped to your house the next day. Cause we all know gunsmiths don't have wait lists now. Um, but was able to get a gun put together in six creed and get some dope before the match and ended up doing pretty well. And then decided I wanted to jump feet first all off in and built a couple more as backup rifles and decided I want to start shooting competitively. Um, initially it was want to get better at hunting. Um, and I know a lot of guys down here have started for the same reason. They feel like that it allows them to be able to take a deer or a pig or whatever at what most hunters would consider long range and where a PRS guy, five, 600 yard shots, not that challenging. It's still a sporty shot, but you don't expect to miss a pig at five or 600 yards, either off a bench or a stable front rested position. Um, and now I don't hunt anymore. I just run matches or shoot matches. So, um, do you still do you still shoot? Uh, I go out and proof stages. I I try to make one or two two day matches a year just to see what other match directors are doing, see what other rangers are doing, see what props they're using, to see if I can bring that stuff back to our range and incorporate it into our matches. Good deal. So. You and I were, uh, before the show, we're talking a little bit about what it takes to, uh, to really be competitive in the Precision Rifle Series these days or, or in, in any of the rifle series. So tell me a little bit about your opinion about all that. What, how do you feel about all that? As far as being on that upper echelon competitive I want my name to be dropped in the hat if I show up in a match that there's a chance I can win it. I personally feel like um, I would have to shoot 10,000 rounds of live ammunition on a range, off props, off prone, and I would have to know my dope inside and out, no questions asked. Along with that, I would probably have to spend a couple of hours every, every day or every other day dry firing just to make sure I can break that position and rebuild it on a on a chair on whatever prop I can find at my house um and that's a ton of money and a ton of time commitment just before you even go to shoot matches and I mean a match if you're trying to go on the the cheap end, you're seven, eight hundred dollars to go shoot a match on a normal match. It's a thousand bucks a weekend. I don't know Along that I've with, ever got got out of one for a thousand dollars, but they're yeah, it's uh, yeah, you know, to shoot. I don't know what the most matches ever shot in here was maybe two day matches, maybe eight or ten. And I figured about twelve hundred dollars a weekend minimum, and that doesn't yeah. include your practice ammo. And, you know, back when I was doing pretty well, kind of consistently in top 20, top 30, I, that particular year that I did, I, I shot, I, I was, I, I shot 10,000 live rounds. I dry fired at least five times for every one of those rounds. And, uh, you know, I was gone every other weekend for the first three months of the year. And then it just, you have to have a passion for it. You know, people who, who are good at something. And I've, I've, come to, I've come to learn this. If you want to be the best at something, you have to love it so much that you never get tired of practicing. That's what makes a champion. You know, if you do your research, you'll find out that the, the people who are at the best, whether it's golf or shooting or swimming, it doesn't matter what they're the best at. It's because they never get tired of practicing. And uh, I didn't mind practicing, but I realized at some point that it just wasn't going to pay the bills. There was no no matter how much money I spent, no matter how many matches theoretically that I won, it was never going to go anywhere, you know? So I, I just, I kind of someday had to say, what's, what's the point of all this really? Okay, you and realize it's kind of about ego. It goes, it, it turns into a thing you're doing for your ego, really. And something I tell all our new shooters is at the end of the day, Paul, this is a hobby. 
we need to treat it like a hobby. It's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be enjoyable. Yes, we all are all alpha. We all are competitive. But at the end of the day, it's still a hobby. And if you treat it like a job and you're not getting paid for it, you're not going to do it very long. So we we try to maintain the the fun atmosphere, the lower stress, and we want everybody to have a good time. Yeah, you guys run a great match, definitely. I don't know how many times I've shot down there with y'all, but it's uh, I've never done really well down there. That wind always kills me. I just man. <laughs> I remember she especially stage, you're not the first one. I remember shooting a stage down there, Prentice. This is an absolute true story. It was out on that point that shoots out over the long field and and yep. uh Mount I was the last shooter in the in the in the group, last shooter in the squad. So everybody was like, okay, it was a mill, half mill, half mill, mill, half mill. And I got up there and and I couldn't hit anything. I mean, I literally it took me eight shots before I ever hit a target. And then I I hit the last four or whatever. And, and I got done, the RO said, man, the, the wind just died. So the wind had been blowing consistently throughout the other 11 or 12 or 13 shooters. And then I got up there and it died. And I thought, you know, maybe this is not my calling. <laughs> Those moments when you think, why am I doing this? But, uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy a tough when the wind does that. It's like voodoo. And out there, it can switch between shots. I've seen it go from three three tenths right at 400 yards to three tenths left between shots. You just got to pay attention and focus. Yeah, I gave uh, David Preston a shot and, and turned around and David Preston, Preston asked me what I held. And it was, it was like a 600 yard target. So I was, I was on the left edge and he missed the first two shots. And when the match, when he was done, he looked at me like, just with this look like I had intentionally misled him on the wind. It just, it just switches that fast. I mean, you don't think at five or 600 yards, the wind's going to switch two or three tenths over 10, 10, 15 seconds, but it, it absolutely can and will. So you do a great job down there. I appreciate it. Crazy. That wind, if we could just like kill the wind, I would shoot great. <laughs> yeah, you and everybody else. So what's going on in your personal life, Brennan? Tell us about your personal life. Um, personal life, last year with corona here in the state of Texas on middle of March in the teen days, our Governor Abbott shut down Texas. And um, I was supposed to get married that weekend. So we went from about 300 people uh, to a live Facebook event to about 700 people. I was there. <laughs> well, I was so there. got married, uh, had, uh, had to postpone our honeymoon. That was a, that was a fun event. The night of our wedding, being on the phone with Sandals Resorts, trying to reschedule and postpone and all that fun stuff, but got all that done, ended up, uh, postponing the honeymoon till, September and uh, at the last Monday I we got a new person to introduce us to don't we you? got TSM's youngest fan Miss Addison Amanda oh he is precious she definitely takes after her mom and I'm glad <laughs> she's our biggest fan how is mom Ashley you can Mom's post a picture too you did all that hard work on that baby. <laughs> Mom is good. She feels like a small train wreck now, not a big one. So <laughs> it's getting better. That is success right there. If you only feel like slightly derailed, it's that's good. Yeah, Prentice, this is a pretty cheap stunt to get out of having to change diapers for a couple of hours. So. <laughs> and the diapers don't bother me. Um, I'm not going to be that dad that's like, nope, not changing diapers ever because, I mean, it takes it takes both of us. At this point, I think he's uh, changed more diapers than I have, actually. Good, Good job, buddy. I'm proud of you. That, is that Addison's rifle behind you? No, that's uh, that's one of our loaner rifles. That's uh, a voodoo action with the Leopold Mark V in a 
AIAX chassis donated by mile high. So, so that's you, one of our loaner 22 rifles. Are as nice as my rifle. I know. Are you getting Addison a rifle? I mean, yes, Addison will have a custom impact action with her initials and her birth date as a serial number. Um, haven't decided what caliber it's going to be to start with. Um, but yes, yeah, she will have her own custom rifle center fire. Um, she, her first rifle is actually the rifle my brother and myself grew up shooting along with my dad. So it'll be a little cricket 22. You know, they make those in chassis now. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it in the old beat up wood stock just for nostalgia reasons. Otherwise, yeah, it'd be in a chassis. It'll put a rail and a scope on it and, you know, throw a Leopold Mark V 735 because everybody needs that on a Cricket 22. It'd be longer than the gun. And, of course, I would put the sunshade on there, so. Yeah. Like, people say that, like, my 22 looks extreme back here with the – with the PST and the sunshade and everything, but like that, that would literally be longer than the gun. Yes. It'd be like a US Optics SN9. <laughs> Hilarious. So are we having, uh, we plan on having some more kids for us? Uh, that's the goal. We gotta, we gotta get this one raised a little bit more before we move on to the next set. I don't know. Go ahead and knock on okay. the while they're all babies, then you could do all the diapers at once and then move on. Well, that's the goal, but she's eight days old. So maybe get her to like 15, 20 days before we start. It's like asking somebody about food right after they've eaten. You know, hey, you know, probably, maybe not right now. I'm always good for food right after I eat. Me too. But also, that's unless it's a four dollar dessert, and then um, I'm gonna have to question life choices and see if we can move some money around. Hmm. So, how old are you, Chris? I don't know that. I am 36. Wow, you waited late in life to get married. I did. I waited late in life to get married. I waited late in life to start a family, but I enjoyed my 20s and 30s. I've got, I've got some friends I went to high school with that have kids that are graduating high school now. So, I mean, there's two ways to look at that, so. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah. So we're gonna hit a couple lives real quick. Um, Eric Lundberg said, hey, Prentice, you got them scores yet? Yes, I've got all the scores, Eric. They may not be the scores you want, but I've got all the scores. <laughs> he also said congrats on the new addition to the family. Appreciate it, Eric. And Jorge said, what's up to everyone? Uh, William Cullen said, congrats to you two for your bundle of noise. Bundle of noise. <laughs> she only squeaks and yeah, she, pterodactyl. Yeah, she, she pterodactyls is what my wife calls it. It sounds like a pterodactyl, but my wife calls it pterodactyling. <laughs> Wait a year. It will turn into blood curdling. Screams. Back to, uh, let's get back to shooting. Not that I don't love babies. <laughs> so, what do you see? Where do you see this all going? Where do you see the PRS going? Where do you see the? How do you see the matches changing over the next five years? I mean, we've. Uh, I I can't speak for Jennifer or Greg, but Paul. I mean, you and I have seen the matches change in the past five years a ton from the whole match experience, the number of matches, what is kind of a staple now. It's uh, – I remember going to matches and you had to pack water in. You had to bring a lunch. You maybe got a T-shirt if you were lucky. Oh, I, I've told the story about the first year I shot the heat stroke and Sunday morning we pulled up to this range – that we didn't shoot on Saturday morning, and there was nothing. And everybody's like, "Where is the porta potty?" Oh, there's no porta potty. That nothing. Was a problem. There is nothing. There was nothing. And that's uh, Texas. True story. And Texas Precision Matches, we have a female porta potty on both ends of the range, Jennifer. So, 
and it's labeled that way and the guys actually respect it and they don't go in there so i'm not picky i'll use the same porta potty as everybody else i just don't want to have to drop trowel in front of everybody no i don't blame you yeah. So, do you think we're headed for no prize tables? Do you think we ought to be headed for no prize tables? I mean, that's a tough one. I think uh, I think the prize tables are a good thing. I think they're a little over fantasized about for some, <laughs> but I do think that the prize tables give some incentive for these guys to come and shoot and try to do well. Um, I know from a match director standpoint calling people and requesting stuff and trying to set up a, a package for each individual person. I mean, when, if I call PMAC, I mean, you're a relatively small one or two person shop that you produce a few guns a year versus calling Remington. Yeah. Who's no longer in business or Savage Arms who produces a million guns a year. I mean, they don't need the social media. They don't need any of that. If they want to donate to the PRS or to our matches, they're going to do it and they're going to get what we tell them they're going to get, but they don't need it. Whereas if you donate, you're going to see the, the Facebook posts from Texas Precision Matches. You're going to see the Instagram, the Twitter. You're going to see all that where it's promoting PMAC, Precision, and it may actually get you some business. That you know, you I didn't could... think about that, Prentice. I've, 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 I mean, I'm still in business, you know. So. <laughs> it's true. But things like that, I mean, the, the price tables are tough, especially this year with the companies. There's not a gun company in the country that needs help selling anything. Yeah. They are all selling everything they can produce. Yeah, so, if they're not willing I mean, to give you prizes. It's probably because they they just can't produce enough stuff to have an extra one. It's not right. a it's not a matter of greed. They just can't get one to give you. They're all that, and we've been we've been told that a bunch. Yeah, like just flat out, I can't. I, it's not that I don't want to. It's just we we can't fulfill our orders. So how can we donate something to a prize table when we can't even fulfill our own orders? Yeah. Yeah, people don't um, think about that. It's not always. Uh, it's not always that they're not willing to give. There's there's more to putting stuff on price table than people think. And for a guy like me, it's very tough to do because it comes straight out of my pocket, which is pretty tough. But uh, I'm always, you know, I've, I've helped a couple of people out over the years and I've, I've, I've been glad to do so, but it's pretty tough for the smaller guys. But uh, yeah, I don't I know. I, I wonder where, so, so you can't ask that question without asking this question. How many people should, what do you think should is a reasonable number of shooters in a match? What, what are you guys doing for, for your limit on your matches? Um, for our one-day matches, we run standard, what we call a standard club matches, eight stages, and we limit it to 96 shooters. Um, puts 12 shooters a stage. We can still get those about 40 to 45-minute turn times. To where it's not just unbearable um for our big two-day matches where we're running 18 stages we're 170 to 180 shooters is about where we limit it just we don't want to be there all day the shooters don't want to be there all day either they they still want to go hang out with their friends they still want to go have a beer and we don't want to have to start at sunrise, fortunately. Um, and we don't want to shoot till sunset, especially at our range where the sun sets in your face. And you want to talk about washing targets out. It, it becomes next to impossible to shoot if you get too late in the day. Yeah, again, the heat stroke. I, I, we, get, we came off the last stage one year at the heat stroke at 830. And, mm -hmm. uh, that, and started, it started as the sun was coming up. I mean, literally, I the sun that. wasn't even up yet when we fired the first shot. And it was 105 degrees that day. So yeah, There's a reason they call it the heat stroke. Yeah, but I mean, that wasn't fun. There's nothing fun about that. You don't leave that thinking, gosh, I, I can't wait to do that again in, you know, <laughs> six months or whatever. So I will say this, you know, you're about 96 people in a one-day match. The first PRS match I actually really would say that I shot had about 80 people in it. 
And that was a big match. You know, didn't he didn't the concept of what they're doing at the gap grind is is to me it, I, I've been there and you know we've all been there a number of times, but it, it can't be done. You can't run 400 people through a match in, in two days, but they're doing it. They're making it work and it works well. But man, if you'd have told me that seven, eight, nine years ago, I would have said there's no way you can get it because because it was all you could do to get 80 people through in two days. But nobody really knew what they were doing. You know, we were all right, learning I mean, on the job. You know, so that was back when we had stages where you had to you had to use your reticle to find distances and stuff, and they'd have to give you two minutes to shoot the stage or something. So it's, yeah. it's you know, those the, things have changed and they've changed for the better. But uh, I, 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 I kind of wish ten people's plenty in a squad. I'll say that if you got more than I, 10, I agree. I like to keep it around that ten and under mark. That's that's the goal. I mean, I don't want to turn a bunch of shooters away either, though. It's so we cap it at 96, and, I mean, you had two extra shooters. You're talking six minutes. Re reality, it's six minutes extra per stage, which, you know, over over the course of a day, it's going to add, you know, almost an hour to the day. Yeah, that's, that's another thing is people don't realize, and I, I ran pistol matches. It was the same way with pistol matches. You can make some very minor changes in a stage or in the in the design of the entire match, and it can make a huge impact on how long that match takes to complete. You know, so you have to, as a match director, people don't understand that you can't just design stages. You have to think about how far stage A is from stage B and how long it's going to take to get. I mean, it's just way more complicated than people think. And uh, so, for you guys to do as good a job as you've done down there is. You know, I, I've never been to a match that I enjoyed more than y'all's or that I thought was run better than y'all's. So. Well, I do appreciate how do you, it. And... How do you keep them interesting? Like, do you change up the stages every match that you do? Or, I mean, there are some uh, matches that you go to that, like, I could read the book and tell you exactly where each stage was and what it is just because they stay very similar, if that makes sense. So oh, yeah. change it up. How do you keep it fresh and interesting for the shooter? So fortunately for our range, Jennifer, we're not a, so we've got two sides. We've got a tree side and we've got a ridge side. The tree side is your typical square range, one direction, pretty much just one lane that goes out to 1100 yards. There's not a whole lot I can do with angles or, targets or anything like that but it does allow me to go and if we shoot a tank trap i mean we can go out to six or seven hundred yards with a tank trap or we can bring it into 300 yards i mean i can make it where it's a favorable target six seven hundred yards make you shoot fast or make it a smaller target at 300 yards and make you slow down um on the ridge side, it is about a 210 acre, just wide open flooded bottom. So we've got about 90 to 110 degrees that we can play with as far as sweeping angles. And I know um, just for reference, I know we've all shot at Altus, the rocks on the far left-hand side of the range. You know, you yeah, I make the same face, Jennifer. Um, Me and the rocks are not friends. If if you took that one 730 yard lane and you turned it to where y'all shoot off of um, out of the shoot house and made them shoot at that angle, I know it's unsafe, but had you able to turn it, that takes that rock stage and makes it a completely different stage. And if you do that for a big match where the locals don't know you're doing that, it makes it more of a fair match. I mean, they've never shot that angle. They've never shot that way. And, and we try to do that. I mean, Paul McCoy, the, before um, we were talking about when he was shooting off Mount Baldy, which is one of a, the far right-hand side of our ridge range, we used to shoot hard right, like just almost down the tree line. And for a few years, we got away from that. And this last two-day match, I moved the firing line back about 15, 20 yards. And we shot a troop line back hard right. And I will tell you, it ate some of our locals' lunch just because they'd never shot that way. And that wind was whipping. And 
we were actually setting targets and I had Chase Stroud out there helping me just as on a spotter, trying to make sure we were making it easier on the spotters too. And just a standard troop line straight out. And I asked Chase, I said, man, just tell me what you think the wind is doing. And he, uh, he was like, yeah, I think it's about a 12 mile an hour wind. And where I was standing, it was absolutely nothing. There was zero wind, but where Chase was standing, it was probably 12 to 15. So just finding those little gaps like that to make it interesting. So uh, on that line, what do you think a winning percentage ought to be for a match? What what is you what do you what do you what is your goal? Uh, every match. My goal personally. Goal. Yeah, you have a goal. Um, your match director, you have a goal for what you want the winner to shoot. What what is your your goal? For a two day match, we're we're right around. We run eighteen stages for a two day match, and we're around. 160 to 170 shoot shots on the day. And honestly, if you drop 15 to 20 is where I try to design most matches for the winners where they're going to drop 15 to 20. And I've been utterly shocked at some matches where you get a, a Dave Preston or uh, Morgan King come in and just read the wind and catch fire and they drop six or seven. Um, and I've seen other matches where no one can find the wind and it's 30. So, I mean, it's extremely difficult to say what it's going to be. I mean, we like to design them for 15 to 20 for the winner. And that, that let, that allows the middle class guys to be able to go and hit targets and enjoy the match too. I mean, we don't want, we don't want to, and I have this conversation with people all the time as far as if I designed a match where I took the top 30 in the AG series, just take those elite shooters in the AG series, and I made it where they hit 60% of the targets. What's that going to do to a guy like me or a middle-of-the-pack shooter if we've got the best shooters in the country only hitting 60%? I mean, I'm going to hit – 20, maybe 30% of targets available, and I'm not going to have fun. Yeah, I've, I've been to matches where there were people, uh, and I won't tell you what match it was, but you can probably guess, um, where there were people that hit 20 or 30 targets all weekend. And that doesn't, you know, in the end, this is kind of a business, really. You, you, we do this to some degree for money, and it's, it's just not a good business model. You know, people don't enjoy that. And secondly, they don't learn anything. You know, you, don't, you can't learn if you're not shooting. So if you're not hitting targets, you're not learning anything. What do you think, Jennifer? You agree with that? I think it's very hard to balance it. You don't want it to be so easy that everybody is going up and cleaning every stage. I mean, that, yeah, it's fun for the people that are cleaning it, but it's not competitive then. You've got to have something that's going to divide the field. But I agree, it's very difficult for, and I've been that newer shooter and still have matches where I'm, shooting like a newer shooter <laughs> and so it's very frustrating to pay all that money and go and not hit a lot of targets and feel very defeated um you know if people go home defeated they're not going to come back so i think that match directors have a very difficult job to try to make it challenging for those top guys but also make it to where people can hit stuff right I mean, you don't want to go to a match and not hit anything because you won't want to come back. Yeah, and it's not only that, but like one of the biggest things that I said after we shot the uh, the match Jarrett Rifles is that it was a very balanced match. Like, I, I'm not a fan of stages where you have to be an excellent positional shooter. You have to be able to read the four different wins that are in between you and your target. You have to be skilled at long, like incredible, you know, the, the longer, the 1200 yard shots and there's a mental game mixed in there. Um, for the higher level shooters, you know, your, your AG cup contenders and stuff like that, you know, it's, it's fun to watch them shoot it, but as a, I don't even know if I even count as like an intermediate shooter. I'm, I still feel like I'm bottom of the barrel, you know, when, when you have multiple stages that are like that, where, you know, if I have a stage that's, all positional and I can put my entire mind towards like, okay, you know, this, this is where my body needs to be. Watch my breathing. 
you know, and I can work really hard and do decent on that. And then another stage that, you know, you got three different wins that I'll get a zero on. And then another stage with, uh, you know, breaking up your skill sets in between your stages, I think is something that helps out the, you know, the, the lower to middle of the barrel shooters like myself. That's definitely something we do as far as like one of the stages for our last match, it's a four shot KYL rack. And it is, we ran it off an elevated platform, 519 or 523 yards, starting with a 10 inch going down to a five inch circle. And I ran it, the first time you shot it, it was hit to move on. The second time you ran it, it was hit or miss move on. And then the third time you ran it was back to hit to move on. So I kind of incorporated the, you only got four shots each time but I kind of incorporated the mental of, well, am I on the hit to move on or am I on the hit or miss move on aspect of it. And I'm like you, Greg, I don't like the, I don't mind the Sims games. I don't mind the mental games, making you think, where am I at? What am I doing? But I also don't want, you know, that to be incorporated with. Balancing on a tightrope tight rope or. Yeah. You know, some unstable prop or anything like that on top of it. So I'm 100% in agreement with you on that. We're setting up targets where you're looking directly into the sun for the first hour of the morning. And you literally, if you, if you get the wrong stage first thing in the morning, you can't see the target. No one can see the target. I've, I've been to that match. So you, you, drop, you, know, you drop almost every point. So it's, <clears throat> you know, you're, yep. you're doing a good job. There's, the, the matches overall have gotten a lot better, a lot more consistent. They used to be all over the place. My favorite matches are ones that have a variety of all of those things. Like mm -hmm. every, every stage should have a stressor of some sort, in my opinion, because anybody can lay down and shoot, right? Anybody can lay down and pull a trigger. So one stage, the stressor may be that it's very positional heavy and you've got to move. One stage may be a time constraint. So it might be a troop line with a lot of dialing and, and it's 12 shots. Um, so, you, you know, you've got to keep moving. One of them may be, you know, really small targets. One, of, You know, I, I feel like there's got to be something that's a challenge on every stage. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, the really hairy ones are the ones that, that add like three challenges at once, like tricky wins, positional and small targets, you know, or, or a time constraint. That's, um, that's when it gets tricky. Um, and I think that's really what divides the field and puts those that are really good shooters and can pull all of those things together at once. It really, they excel on those where us mere mortals maybe don't. <laughs> so Prentice, what do you think, what, what changes would you like to see in, in the way these matches are put on? What do you, what do you think would be a, overall would be a, a way to go that might make things better than they are today? I'd like to see them become more of an event. I'd like to see them where we have vendors show up with tents and product and new releases happen at these matches. Um, I mean, I'm told time and time again, talking to these sponsors that, I mean, we all know that the hunting market is where the money's at, but the PRS market drives that market. We're, I've got guys I work with that, don't know anything about precision rifle shooting, but they know exactly what Morgan King shoots down to what bullet, what scope, what rings, same thing with Matt Bruso and all of these elite shooters, they follow them and they go and buy the stuff that they're using. Um, your, uh, your coworkers are a lot more informed than mine. Mine just come to me. Oh, they come to me too, but they do a little bit of research on their own. Yeah. And I mean, that, that's the thing. It's like a, a lot of your PRS shooters are, you know, out in public, you're, you're the gun guy or the gun girl. And, you know, I have people come to me all the time. Hey man, you know, I was at, I was at Bass Pro Shop and I bought the scope for $69 and for some reason I can't hit my targets. I'm like, hey. yeah, no. So, you know, go, you know, buy this Vortex and, you know, buy, buy these, um, buy these rings and, you know, then, you know, make me out at the range, we'll get a zero for you. And uh, they're like, well, it doesn't have yardages on it. I'm like, you don't need yardages. We'll, we'll make you a dope card. You know, just trust me, trust me, it'll work better. 
Um, so I think by, you know, the sponsors showing up and, you know, getting us in front of their new products, we're just kind of naturally out there about what we do for fun. And people just kind of come to us like, you know, oh, you know, you always post pictures with a big gun. Let me ask you questions. And I mean, the other thing, I mean, this, our last AG match, which I'm about 90% sure we're going to make this a yearly tradition for our April matches. After the match, Impact Precision and Cody Bradshaw came down and we cooked 450 pounds of crawfish. Oh. Um, Paul McCoy can remember at uh, the Rifle Ranch, Schillen came in every year and cooked crawfish. That's where I got the idea from. I mean, yeah. and I was shocked at how many people stuck around for hours afterwards that were different clicks. I mean, brand new shooters eating crawfish next to highly elite shooters and holding conversations about shooting and about life and other things as well. So having, having the events afterwards to where it's not just show up, shoot, go to a hotel room, show back up the next day, get your award and leave where it's hanging out with friends and making it fun. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep I, I agree. So you guys jumped on board with the new PRS 22 series pretty, pretty quick out out in Texas. Um, is this the first rimfire match that you guys have done out there? No, I mean, we've run, we've run rimfire matches for about two years. And to be honest, we were, we were on the verge of fixing to make a decision of, is this going to stick around? Are we going to continue doing this or are we going to hang it up? Um, fortunately, the shooters started showing up in droves and, it got to the point where we just asked the range owner if we could take another portion of his range that wasn't being utilized and about a 300 yard lane and turn it into our 22 range. And I mean, we built all new props. We've got the same props that we have on our big range on our 22 range. Um, just brought in a bunch of dirt berms because at uh, 300 yards with a 22, um, you need sand berms. Like we tried big metal four by four backers and it just wasn't, they worked, but they didn't, that wasn't the answer. So brought in sand berms um, and we're getting between 60 and 80 shooters on our 22 matches once a month. 22 is where it's at. That's how I agree wholeheartedly. You're going to grow the sport, especially with the ammo costs and shortage right now. If we don't grow 22, I think it's going to really hurt the sport because a lot of people are, I mean, I'm shooting less. It's really hard to get, uh, <clears throat> it's really hard to get ammo components. It's really hard to afford it all. So 22 is definitely where it's at. Yeah, and I mean, I, I honestly believe in the next uh, in the next three to five years, I see the 22 series being as big or bigger than the centerfire. I mean, it's more family friendly. Um, there's no hearing protection. Yes, there's still the competitive side of it. Yes, there's still the the will and want to win, but it's not as stressful because of I think the distance makes a big difference you hear 300 yards and you're like oh okay that's that's fairly easy not realizing you're still going to dial 10 to 12 mils of elevation at 300 yards with a 22. Um, one other thing that I think has helped us grow our 22 stuff is just like this loaner rifle behind me it's a, a voodoo action with a Leopold Mark V in a AIAX chassis We've got a JP MR19 chassis with a Voodoo and a Mark V. And we've also got a Manners um, stock with a Voodoo and a Mark V and Kestrels for everyone. We've got loaner Kestrels. And along with that, we have an extra Kestrel to where I can hand a new shooter a Kestrel and say, here's the Kestrel. I'm going to push the same buttons you're pushing to show you how to use this and how to utilize this equipment versus me just taking it from them and running through real quick, pushing all the buttons and saying, all right, here you go, have at it. 
Um, so they can show up with absolutely nothing, pay the match fee, buy the two boxes of ammo that we we have at every match. Um, and that's another thing. We bought we bought a lot of ammo and we sell it at our matches. We limit it to 200 rounds per person. But guys know they can show up to our match, buy the ammo they need, and be able to shoot. And that's huge. Yeah, especially right now. That's awesome. Huge in this day and age. In this yeah. market right now, it's huge to be able to have the components. I hear so many people that that's why they're not shooting as they can't get what they need. Um, I mean, the loaner program, we've got loaners on both sides. So we've got two JP gas guns, a JP bolt gun on our center fire side, along with a mile high donated AI, a AIX, the new precision rifle AI that'll be coming hopefully this month or next. Um, and then on our rim fire side, we've got three voodoos all tricked out. Like, I mean, you're not going to, you're not going to lose the match because you were out equipment with our loaners. Um, awesome. And we've got 12 to 15 guys a match that are using these loaners. I was about to say, and even if you don't have as many loaners as you have shooters, they can share like with 20. Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I came from three gun where I could be like, Hey, come shoot a match. As long as you have a pistol, you can borrow my rifle and my shotgun. No big deal. And it wasn't a big deal. I go to a precision match and it's a lot harder to do that because around counts on your barrel and the barrel getting too hot. It's just not as feasible to share on a center fire long range rifle, but 22, I mean, it's perfect. Yeah. We've had, we've had entire squads of eight running the exact same gun mm -hmm. where, and we just handle mags and say, Hey, here's four mags. Just keep them full. And right. there you go. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've had, I, I think the most I've had is four people shooting my rifle because I, I had this old Savage that I got when I was a kid and put a, a Athlon actually sent me a Argos BTR Gen 2 for it. So it's got a decent scope on it. But like that, that gun is just not as accurate as my gun. So I think I've had four people at the same match shooting my rifle before. And it's, 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 it's easy enough. Just everybody holds a box of ammo, you know, shoot your stage, reload the mags, put it back in the middle and everyone else grabs it. Um, I got another gun on the way. That's a designated loaner rifle for my match. I, I actually won a uh, Bagara B14R at an NRL 22 X match. So I got like all the awesome parts that are going to bolt onto it sitting over there. And then whenever that gets here, that will be a really awesome loaner rifle. I totally think Addison will be tearing up 22 in about eight years. Oh, heck yeah. I think it's going to be sooner than that. We've got a – Kate was six when she started shooting our matches, and I get parents calling me all the time, what's your age limit? What's your age limit? What's your age limit? We don't have an age limit. We have a – are they competent? Can they, can they do it safely? That's our biggest thing is can they do it safely? And I don't mean – move the gun because I don't expect a six-year-old to pick up these guns and move them. I very much tell the parents, y'all can pick them up. Y'all can put, put them in position. They just have to pull the trigger. Um, so that's, that's where we're at as far as that goes. So, I mean, we've had six-year-olds, we've got, we've got a couple of Kate's eight now. Um, and we've got a couple of 10 and 11 year olds that I think are going to be really good. One of our, uh, we have two different – we have a youth class, which is 11 and under, and then we've got a junior class, which is 12 to 16. Um, and our junior shooter won our series last year overall. He beat everybody. That's awesome. Don't laugh, Greg. <laughs> you know, I've always – that, 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 uh, oh, hey. How's it going, buddy? Good. People will spend money on their kids that they won't spend uh, on themselves, you know. So people go broke taking their kids and keeping them busy. So that's a that's a good good business. That is true. Mm -hmm. I think it's you're going broke. You're going broke feeding your kid, aren't you, Jennifer? Yeah, he just got an entire bag of chips. 
they're about they're about to be gone. Yeah. Yeah, that's gone. <laughs> so uh Prentice, I hear you guys actually landed the finale for the first year of the PRS twenty two league. Yep. We're uh we Texas Precision Matches will be hosting the PRS finale at Triple C in Navasota on December 4th and 5th or 3rd, 4th and 5th. I'm not sure. The first weekend in December. It's my wife's birthday. She's super pumped that we have a match every year on her birthday. So just, just another uh, joy of running matches and figuring out when we can do it. And especially here in College Station with Texas A&M, hotels and everything revolves around Texas A&M as far as if we can get them or not. So we know there's not going to be any football in December in town. So that's when we could host it. And I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to that match a ton, just trying, like I said, make it an event, make it where there's stuff to do afterwards, especially here in Aggieland. There's, if you want to go all out and stay at a five-star hotel and eat, five-star food every night you can or if you want to go eat Fuego's tacos which are phenomenal you can go do that too or Taco Crave William El Jefe Grande is a phenomenal taco there so we actually had a live question what is the best taco in College Station that's a tough one there's a bunch of bougie taco places um uh, I mean, it would, for me personally, it would either be the El Presidente from Fuego's Tacos, which if you shot our match in January, we did have uh, Fuego's Chicken and El Presidente, or Fuego's Steak, and then the chicken one was El Presidente. Um, the Taco Crave in Bryan is also a phenomenal place. They've just got, it's your typical street tacos with whatever meat you want and just point at it and say, there you go. You're making me. Uh, you're making me miss Texas. So. <laughs> they don't have good tacos down there. Oh man, let me tell you a story, Prentice. This is an absolute true story. When I first moved down here, I went to a taco place in Pascagoula, Mississippi. Or it was a Mexican food place. I don't order fajitas because I was scared to death. I'm thinking, okay, you can't screw fajitas up. It's grilled chicken, you know. Yeah, you can. It had barbecue sauce of some kind on it. I sent it back. I wouldn't eat it. It was. It was. I just looked at it. It didn't even look like fajitas. And I knew then that I was in real trouble. I knew. That is weird. Paul, over in Mississippi off exit, I think, 53 on I-10, there's a barbecue joint called The Shed. Yep, I've been there. Okay. I say it's not it, – it's pretty good barbecue. It's in, it's, it's in Magnolia Springs, isn't it? That's, that's right there at Magnolia Springs. Yeah. Yeah, it's right there before you get past the past. Yeah, we stopped. Uh, my wife stopped, made me stop there going to uh, Altus one year. Yeah, the barbecue down here is not great either. I mean, it's there's a couple of places that are decent, but it certainly doesn't compare with anything that, you know, you would find in Texas. But, uh, you know, the seafood is off the hook and uh, the steaks are not too bad. There's some really good Italian places, but uh, man, I miss. I, when I go home to Texas on the rare occasion I get to go home to Texas, I literally eat Mexican food pretty much every meal. So I know you would believe that, British. You would understand. Most people wouldn't understand. Yes, I would understand. <laughs> there were a bunch of pictures from Texas of cloud formations and skies like a week and a half ago. Y'all must. Oh, it's been here. Oh my God, those were crazy. Wicked. It's been here all week. We've been getting the big thunderstorms, um, tornado warnings. Clouds. Yep, that's been a that's been all week here. I'm about I'm about ready for the rain to let up a little bit, let my backyard dry out. Well, I'll tell you a story that make you appreciate how different it is living in different places. So we've been having power surges, and uh, for the last couple of days, we got online and started looking around. Well, all of the rain that Texas is getting is because there's, I guess there's a front that's just sitting there not moving. So we haven't had any rain in two weeks, which is very unusual. And the wind has blown like 30 miles an hour for, for 10 or 12 days. Well, it has blown so much salt out of the ocean 
and coated the power lines and the transformers. And uh, so that's what's causing the power, power uh, surges. They're, they said the rain normally washes it off, but we're not getting any rain. So I've, I've never heard of that. It, it just, it's just odd. You live different places, you have different problems. So. It's very weird. Do we have any lives, Greg? Let's see. Sherry said the best baked potato salad is at the shed. That's my mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chad Glasscock agrees with our comment of lots of money on our kids. He's one of the people I thought about when we made that comment. Yeah. Hey, but at least Demon's fixing to start shooting too, so now we'll have two. Oh, God. Oh, he's going to afford that. Good Lord. Jen, aren't you glad that your kids aren't like hooked on shooting dude i can afford it yeah be like a second mortgage type deal with with how many you got uh joey said prentice is hot joey knows what's up <laughs> um let's see william said his seven-year-old has shot a match up there and had a blast helping him keep score on the tablet And uh, Jorge said, we're starting to see less people at the one-day matches in Cali, Nevada, and Arizona um, because of ammo and components availability, um, which is very true everywhere. Um, I know I've, I've seen it, people struggling to get ammo to come shoot even my little 22 series. Um, and like, people, I'm, people I'm, underestimate children. I don't know if I told you all this story already, but back when I was a teaching pistol, which I did for many years, I taught a, a kid's class. And these kids averaged being about six or seven years old. And uh, the thing about kids is they learn, their, their brains are not corrupted with all of the live crap ours are. And they learn like sponges. So man, we started at nine o'clock in the morning. And I kid you not, by three or four o'clock in the afternoon, we had those kids shooting pistols, walking forward and walking backwards and, and hitting their targets. I mean, they were shooting on the move, and at the end of the day, we had them walking sideways, and they were hitting targets. So, I, I, I mean, I just kind of started the class, and I thought, we'll just go as far as the kids can go, as far as ability, and, and we never got to the end. I mean, they just kept learning. Whatever we showed them to do, they did it. And so, that compared to shooting a rifle at a precision rifle match, these kids will pick this up, you know, super easy, and uh, they'll... You know, we're going to see some some 14, 15 year old kids. We've already seen some 14, 15 year old kids who've who've been able to be competitive in the PRS. So uh, it's I, I think you're going to see the age of the average age of the top of the field probably come down over the next seven, eight, ten years. What do you think, Prince? Yeah, I agree. I mean, especially if you start getting these kids in at seven, eight, nine, ten years old with the 22 side, and then slowly transition them over to the center fire side and they've already got all the fundamentals down from the 22 to where it's just read wind put in the right dope and don't have the mental mistakes i agree kids are definitely going to be the queen of this i don't have the list of questions jennifer do you have a list of questions Jennifer? oh did you send it greg i did you go greg all right so, Prentice, I, I know that you've talked a lot about, you know, your loaner rifle program and having a lot of the newer guys out of your matches, but how do you actively recruit these new shooters to come out to your matches? How do you get them, like, we all know what to do when a new shooter shows up, new shooter shows up, but, like, how do you get them there? I mean, a lot of it's word of mouth. I mean, and I would say a ton of it's word of mouth with just shooter A brings his buddy. And his buddy comes out and watches and it's like, all right, well, next month I'm going to try it. And he tries it and then he brings a buddy. I mean, every month we're seeing 10 to 10 to 12 new shooters and we retain one or two of those every month where they're kind of coming back and becoming a staple. So, I mean, if we can keep 10% of that coming back, I'd like to see it be more 20 or 30%, but I mean, it's not for everyone. And I mean, that's kind of where the loaner program comes in. It allows you to, it allows you to come in and see 
if you want to spend the money. I mean, because you figure if you were going to build a, a voodoo barrel to action, 1700 bucks, just say average chassis, thousand bucks, you're 2700 with no scope, no rings, no trigger. Mm-hmm. So you're three grand when you throw a trigger in there. And then, I mean, if you go spur rings, you're 400 bucks there, 3400 and just say $5,400 for all in on a 22. And I mean, you, seven years ago, if you told me I was going to have a $5,000 22 sitting in my gun safe, much less three of them, I'd have been like, you're crazy. This was supposed to be like a, a base class build. I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, what, what was it? $1,200. I was like, yeah, $600 rifle, throw a couple things on it. We'll be good to go. And now, now, now we have this. She's a beauty though. I think that's the biggest thing with 22 is that people can try it. Like mm. you can't just be like, oh yeah, show up to a rifle match. I mean, there are a lot of generous people out there that have enough barrels and, and guns to be able to let people shoot on, but it's very difficult to, you know, I can barely afford my barrels for the year, much less if I let somebody go shoot a couple of matches with my gun, you know, that's a whole nother barrel. Mm-hmm. So it's, I think that's the best thing about 22 is people can come and like just borrow everything. They can literally show up and borrow everything and kind of see if it fits with them, if they like it. And then if they decide they want to jump in, then they can transition over to a center fire later if they want to. So we had a biathlon, Olympic biathlon medalist that was shooting our 22 matches early on. And I asked her, like at what point do you consider a 22 barrel shot out? And she goes, I don't know, between a hundred and 120,000 rounds. Mm-hmm. I was like, all right, cool. Yeah, I won't shoot one out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to make any money rebarreling those. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, really. Was it Lanny Barnes? Don't get me to line. This was early on. She hadn't, they hadn't, it was her husband shoots and I'm trying to think of her name, but it wasn't Lanny Barnes. She shoots a lot of three gun. That's why I just wondered. All right, Prentice, let's let's get back on something controversial. Um, oh you know, we've got we've got matches that are generating a hundred thousand dollars. Not yours, but there are matches that are generating close to a hundred grand. What do you think about certifying and paying range officers? Some type of a certification course for range officers. And, and then some type of, hey, you know, even if it's $25 a day, you know, whatever. Um, I mean, I am, I am so thankful for our range officers that come out and support our matches and help. And, I mean, a lot of it is our 22 shooters coming over and ROing on the big gun side. Now we do um, Leopold certs, so they get 20 per- – 28% off of retail um, pricing from Leopold on any product Leopold makes. Um, we also do some other things for our range officers. Um, this year, Mile High told us to give away our other loaner gun, which was an AIAT to either Mill LE or a range officer that was deserving. And um, we had one gentleman that stepped up Buck Doucette, and he got a AIAT. Um, Swanee Comp Gear came in like he does every April match and donates a, a prize box full of very useful things for matches. Um, thank you, Jeremy, for that, as always. Um, now, as far as paying, paying range officers, I – my match we just can't do it i mean by the time you put them up in hotels feed them t-shirts everything you have to do what i feel like we have to do for range officers there's not any money for us to pay them when we have you're you're paying for their hotels yeah we pay for their hotels so if they need a if they need a hotel we put them up um that's thanks to my wife taking that headache on because that is trying to call a hotel and say, Hey, I need to book 12 rooms, 15 rooms. Well, what are the names that are going to be under them? I don't know yet, (laughs) but I need the rooms booked. So, I mean, my wife did a 
phenomenal job on that. Um, but like paying them, um, I think it's going to get to the point where if we can get back to some pretty deep and decent prize tables, you just take the take some prize table stuff off the prize table from top to bottom. I mean, if you've got two guns on there, take one of the guns off the prize table and put it on the RO table. Um, I know we've all shot matches where you've got phenomenal ROs and they, uh, they make the match experience that much better versus matches where you've got horrible ROs that just like go, 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 go. You're next. You don't get a shooter brief. Just go shoot it, figure it out on the clock. And it makes the match experience that much worse. So how do we change that? that that's really my point. I'm, the pain in the ROs is kind of a, it, you can there. There's some reward for the ROs no matter what. But uh, we've all been to matches where the ROs were not bad. They were terrible. Right. I mean, I mean, terrible. And it's not as common as it used to be. Yeah, I was about to say. So I'm a lot newer to the sport than literally everybody else on here. And out of all of the matches I've shot, I can say that there is one experience with an RO that I've had that I'm just like, this, this, this wasn't good. And it was, it was purely a missed call, a missed impact. Um, but every other RO at the match was phenomenal. The, I mean, the RO is plenty nice, plenty respectful, but just they missed it. They missed an impact. Um, and it wasn't me shooting at the time either. <laughs> there we go. There's the baby for Swanee. Let's say Swanee was asking to see the baby. Hey, Swanee. Say hey, Swanee. So cute. Um, yep, and Ashley is going to kill you. <laughs> she stays awake till midnight or one, sleeping on my chest while I watch SEC baseball or whatever's on TV. So, wait, you just said she stays awake, sleeping on your chest. Well, I stay awake and she sleeps on my chest. Uh, okay. I was say that makes no sense. Eric, that was that was 100 not you buddy that was a i think that was a, a first time ro without an experienced ro backing them up like you it's not, the, other... it's not the issue it once was uh, and uh, when we first started having some matches out in the western part of the united states in all fairness they just didn't have any experience putting on matches so you can't have experienced ro's when you haven't had these type of matches in your area before and so I'm not faulting anybody, but it, it definitely uh, kind of put a negative connotation on the experience of, and I, and I do feel like as the PRS becomes a more, I know, I know Shannon's working uh, to make it more and more professional and, and more where there's no question as, as, as to what's going on with the times. And, you know, he talked about using timers and things. And I think at some point, you're probably going to see some type of a certification course for ROs, whether it's voluntary or whether it's mandatory or whether it's mandatory for maybe like if you're going to be an RO at the AG Cup, maybe you have to have a certification, you know. No, I mean, I think, I, I think if we did it, the, the best way to go about it would be to make sure you have a certified RO on every stage, which is what I see a lot of match directors doing. Because um, we always tell people like, hey, if you want to learn about if you want to learn about PRS, come out and RO a match, which is exactly what I did. So I, I used going to a match as an excuse to get out of work for a weekend, um, earn the nickname Alpaca. Um, I carried around a bunch of stuff for a bunch of people that weekend. Um, <laughs> hey, Ashley. That's Kitty. Prentice, she's a lot prettier than you are. Well, I um, would hope so. <laughs> I'm married up. Eric, I, I'm pretty sure that like you're actually going to be the one teaching the licensing class, so you don't have to like qualify for it. Just an FYI. Um, but I'm Eric's grandfathered in. To yeah, definitely. Like he's actually he doesn't know this yet, but if this happens, he's going to be the one in charge of the licensing program. Um, but like I don't think it would be a bad idea to say like, hey, you have to have a a, a CRO on every on every stage, but then you can have a backup spotter. And you can have a scorekeeper and you can have this and that and the other thing. And well, a lot of times that's the shooters, you know, and some of the PRS uh, mm -hmm. have the different, and I can't remember the different, what they call each one, mm -hmm. but they have where you can do like the option two, where it's the shooters that are rotating. Mm -hmm. So you have a stationary RO at each stage, but then 
the other people are away in the stage are from the squad. Yep. And I, you know, I, I don't think that would be a bad idea. And, you know, we just got to make sure that it's something that's, that's accessible. You know, it, it can't be, I mean, let's be real. Chad just said Eric Lumberg is the King RO, but Chad's actually going to be the assistant teaching the classes. Um, you know, but it, it can't be something where Eric and Chad have to teach the whole thing. And you got to, you know, show up in a match where they're at. It has to be something where, you know, okay, I'm running a match tomorrow. This person backed out. According to PRS rules, I can't run this. But, you know, there, there has to be a way to get people on. I mean, to Paul's point, though, talking about paying the ROs, um, Prentice, you said that y'all pay for hotels. Like, I would go RO more. But if I go RO a match, I have to take time off work. So that's exactly. Awesome. Then I have to travel there. Then I have to buy a hotel you know for some of these matches it's just not feasible uh, you know i'm not a dude so it's not like there's 200 other people i could share a room with there's maybe nope. three other people i could share a room with because there's like three other females there i mean you know what i mean it, and i mean we've got so if you know I, I did go out and um to arizona and ro to match out there and they did like a side stage to get money for the ro's which was nice so they ended up giving the ROs some money at the end. But like if they would, you know, paying for hotel, that's huge. So I'm not you know, K&M puts everybody up there on the property. You know, K&M has their little lodging. And so they're, you know, they're covering things there for people. So it's, it's not a bad thing. It's, yeah. I don't, I don't, I'm not as big a proponent of paying the ROs as I am. Of make the, if we're going to run professional level competitions, professional level, they're essentially the referee. Think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, what other what other professional level sport do you have referees with no training whatsoever? So yep. I think that baseball. Day is coming. Baseball. So real quick, <laughs> er, er, Eric said something. I want to ask him a question back. Um, he said, "What makes a good RO a shooter?" He said he still thinks it should be a requirement for an RO to have shot at least one two day match. And I hundred percent agree with that statement. You know, to be a good RO, but. Eric, what to about the lead RO? Yep. To, and, and that's my feeling on it would be, you know, that would be the lead RO. So that would be, you know, Eric being the lead RO with somebody who's never shot a match before running the tablet to, you know, kind of learn a little about, a bit about what's going on. Like, you know, would, would you be, would that, as literally the most experienced RO in the PRS, Eric, would that be something that would be, you know, does, does that sound logical to you or do you think that everybody should have shot a two-day match before i'm just saying that the best ro team ever was at mammoth in january and it i don't i don't know i heard that one of the slackers took like 19 naps during that match it was not while shooters were shooting i had a covid shot my second covid shot and i was dead i mean i was awake every time they were shooting and while they were rucking, I may have been sleeping, but they were rucking, not shooting, so it was okay. Yes, Prentice, I had a couple of questionable arms on match in Colorado because somebody else told me they were going to take care of that, just like they told me they were going to mow the grass so you could see all the targets. And uh, so anyway, yeah, the Colorado match I did was well, – I've been to worse, but it, it was not perfect, and I'm a perfectionist, so I still to this day – it bothers me that it wasn't perfect, but uh, – I think overall, everybody had a pretty good time. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's uh, – the other thing is, uh, as far as the RO stuff goes, it falls on the match director. And, I mean, this – the last AG match, I'll be the first to admit, I I slacked up a little bit and I didn't explain things the way that I should have and I learned a lesson. I mean, um, it falls on the match director to explain to the ROs how you expect a stage to run. And – Back to Jennifer's point of, I mean, I can't ask every RO to come in Friday afternoon to show up for, you know, me to go over their stage for 10 minutes and then turn around and drive an hour and a half, two hours back home or, you know, come in a day early for, you know, have to pay an extra for a hotel room and all that. Um, so Saturday mornings for a typical match for a two day match directors got shooters with questions, ROs with questions registration still is going on t-shirts still have to be handed out matchbooks still have to be handed out you've got to do the safety brief you've got to get the ro's on their stages you've got to get 
spotters, tablets, timers, walkie talkies. There's so much stuff that happens from that six o'clock in the morning till 830 when the first rounds go down range that a lot of people don't see. Um, so it does fall on the match director to make sure that the ROs know how the stages want to be run. Cause I mean, you can have a stage that in your head is perfect and an RO change one little thing. And once one shooter shot it that way, you've got to run it that way for the rest of the match. Um, so uh, that the ROs is always a, a big topic. I mean, cause with what Texas precision matches does and how we expect our matches to run and flow and all that, it takes 40 plus people to do it on top of the, the two match directors. Um, That's a whole nother event. You know, the ROs taking care of the ROs, being the ROs, that's a whole nother that's almost like another little mini match that you're that you're in charge of because our ROs have problems too they they call you and say hey you know what i can't make it this weekend and so you not only have to have ROs, but you have extra you have to have extra ROs. you have to have you know somebody to relieve an ro if they have some kind of a problem you know so well, yeah it's a whole other thing hey one thing joey matu you need to go buy savannah a ring um he told me if I said it on live that he would do it, and I'm sick of bugging him for the past six months to go buy her, his girlfriend a ring, so now he has to do it. Wow, no pressure. Yeah, none at all. We're, we're not all looking at you. <laughs> so, Prentice, over the last year, you've given me a ton of advice as being a new match director. I think every time we've called, it's turned into, like, you know, how, how's your match going, what you doing, you know, give me all sorts of advice. So if one of our viewers right now is watching and kind of thinking about starting a match of any kind, um, like what would be your, your quick, like five minute pep talk? What would you tell them? So first and foremost, I would tell them pick a date and stick with it, whether it's quarterly, whether it's monthly, but pick a weekend, pick a date, stick with it. Um, second, listen to your shooters. Like if, a ton of your shooters come up and tell you this stage is awesome. Keep doing that stage, do a different variation of it, but keep doing it. I mean, we had, we shoot in the winter time, we shoot little dumb, dumb lollipops at 50 yards. It's a super simple stage, but everyone loves it except one person. And he understands that I'm going to continue doing it because 99% of the other people love doing it. Um, if a ton of your shooters say they don't like something, don't do it. Don't just throw it back in there because you think it's funny. If, if they tell you your matches are running a little long, maybe we can get some food out here. If you have to charge an extra 10 bucks to provide lunch, do it. I mean, guys are going to understand. And one huge thing that i I'm fortunate that we don't see it as often now, but coolers and water. At the end of the day, it's cheap. Have coolers, trash cans, and water. If it's hot, have it on ice. If it's cold, just have the water dumped in a cooler. It's not that difficult. And I've talked to match directors where they're like, well, aren't you worried about all the bottles and stuff being thrown all over the place? No, if there's trash cans there, guys use them. Yep. I mean, if... At the end of the day, we go through on a one-day match between 12 and 20 cases of water, and I'll pick up six or seven bottles. On a two-day match, we go between 30 and 40 cases, and I'll pick up 15 to 20 bottles. So it's not that big a deal. When I'm going back and picking up all the coolers and everything, it's fairly simple. You know, um, K&M K &M went to coolers a few years ago. They've gone to the water jugs. Uh, yep. that you can bring your own cup and i bet you they fill those things up every two hours I, I bet those things are empty at the longest every two hours so the amount of water that you can go through at a match is is i think would surprise people i think you'd, i think they'd be shocked at, at how much water it takes uh in a hot you know down there where you are apprentice or k&m where it's always hot so 
you know, people underestimate that sort of stuff. Ice, you know, you can go through a truckload of ice in a weekend. I know you guys used to get a 18 wheeler in a bobtail 18 wheeler full of ice, didn't you? Well, we had a 2000 pound ice machine. It's easier for me to just throw the coolers on a trailer. Um, the night before, run into town, grab my 20 or 40 bags of ice, depending on how many coolers I'm running, fill them up, take them back, drop them off at the stages versus bringing in the ice. And, I mean, it's just easier. Um, I know for our matches on the on the rimfire side, we found a, a local sausage company that – or center fire side, um, local sausage company, we do – sausage wraps and either a cookie or some sort of treat every every match like guys know they're not going to have to bring food and lunch they know they're not going to have to bring water and on the rimfire side we do hamburgers and then depending on what we're feeling like i mean hamburgers or boudin balls depending on if our friends from louisiana come over um and we get in touch with them in time to order the boudin balls. So those are some of the bigger things. The other things I can say is get scores out. I mean, don't make guys – I know I joke and comment a ton on Facebook about scores, but – No, you? Yeah. Never. Don't make guys search for scores. Like, they want to know – people that aren't at the matches want to know. Get it up. Get it posted. Get it uploaded to practice score or whatever you're doing – but do that as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the uh, sausage wrap. You know, the first time y'all had those, I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. And uh, then, you know, I found that it was uh, actually quite good. So uh, I think Yeah, they're phenomenal sausage wraps. Shout out to Salat. You know, there again, you're kind of going off feedback from your, from your folks. And, uh, you know, it's like the Hawaiian food we get uh, at Altus. You know, they get that stuff from the Hawaiian place. It's just phenomenal. And, uh, I couldn't tell you what they have the other day at Altus, but if I could have that Hawaiian chicken and steak every both days, I would take that. That's good stuff, isn't it? Let's say I've I've definitely like yeah. been talking to them and be like, what what match did we go to that we had the the deer stew? Where where was that? Yeah. F- food is definitely a, a, a key thing, and it's uh, you know it, it a it makes you have a better second half of the day if you have a if you have a good meal but then also like a really good meal that that at least in this fat boy's mind that goes down in history now rick reeves tacos were always my favorite the tacos they had up in oklahoma i don't know where he got that the tacos he had some lady making them but uh, they were they were off the hook so i think this is the second time brett has commented on your hamburgers Prentice. he said your hamburger yeah, we do uh we do hamburgers at the 22 match and I don't know if it's hunger. I don't know if it's what it is. They're actually good. That was one of my pregnancy cravings <laughs> for freaking range burgers. <laughs> it is a wise voice that comes from the outside off the camera. It It's literally Lowry seasoned salt, pepper and pre-made H-E-B patties on H-E-B hamburger buns. Nothing special. But it's the pickles. The guys, the pickles aren't the really good, sweet and heat pickles. They're really good, but guys really like them. So we keep doing them. All right. So I've, I've seen this before. What, what is pounders? Several people just said pounders. A quarter. I have no idea, Eric. I, I, I think that's from a different, a different match, but apparently. Yeah. I'm about to say that's, that's not Texas PM. So, Prentice, what goals are coming up for both you and for your matches in Texas? Um, personally, my goals is the – make the matches still fun and interesting, even after running two two-day matches early in the year. Keep the, keep the center fire guys – engaged and knowing they're not going to have to shoot the same match over and over and over again. Um, rim fire side, it's literally just trying to change it up. Same as on the rim on center fire side, um, make it where these guys are shooting different matches. 
at the same range, same direction, same targets, but take the time and effort into going out there and changing things up. Um, Texas Precision Matches goals this year is to finish the year strong, and I don't even really care about growing the numbers right now. Just maintain them, especially with the ammo shortage and component shortage that we're at. If we can just maintain our numbers, I'm going to be – extremely pleased with that um, and make sure the 22 finale is going to be a phenomenal um, a phenomenal match where I'm still talking with Shannon and the PRS 22 directors about the course of fire and how we're going to try and run it because I know one of our biggest complaints at our matches are not everybody shoots the same stages on the same days. So if we have the top 100 all shooting the same stages on the same days, then the bottom 100 are all shooting their stages on the same days. And then we flop ranges. So maybe we can eliminate that and I can set that match up to where if we're shooting 60 yards and positional on stage one, well, in stage 11, we can shoot 60 yards in positional to where we kind of mimic the the match, but on two different ranges. And it's still going to feel like two completely different days because they're going to be different winds, different angles, different everything. So do you see a two-day, do you see a two-day 22 match coming, rimfire match? I see, yes. I, I personally think next year you will start seeing two-day rimfire matches pop up. Um, and hopefully it grows kind of like it did in the beginning with the PRS where maybe there's seven, eight, nine, ten the first year. And, I mean, just see where we kind of meet saturation of, all right, these guys are willing to travel. I mean, I think Shannon and myself and a bunch of other people are going to be testing the waters to see if these guys are really willing to travel for a national level two day rimfire match. Cause that one we're hoping to get between 200 and 220 shooters. That's awesome. That's probably where things are headed. You know, it's kind of like you said, or listen to yours. If something's working, doing it, if it's not, you know, go away. And uh, it is, but you know, I, I told you I ran pistol matches half years at the same range every other Thursday and it just got to where trying to come up with new stages was just it just it was just almost impossible to think of something I hadn't already had them do and I had two guys helping me but uh, this 22 deal is is going to be I think probably what what really pushes the the centerfire thing to the next level and that's where you're that's where you're going to grow the centerfire side of things into an entirely new skill level and uh, really push the whole thing up so, I agree. I think it's definitely the future of the sport. Greg, are there any lives? So, um, Pounders is the other Altus food, apparently. And uh, Chad wants to know, Prentice, why isn't the fireplace in the video? John came to the house. We just, we moved last year as well. Um, Chad came in and helped me and by helped me I mean he did all the work I just kind of carried lumber in um build a fireplace in our living room here I will just turn it around Chad that way your work can be seen damn that looks good I think I remember seeing pictures of that on Facebook oh that and then he helped me sink a, a gun safe in a wall so Thank you for that, Chad. Um, that's where that comment came from. Um, but yeah. Any other lives, Greg? We good on the live side. All right. Well, I think we can wind it down the shout outs. We'll let you get started, Greg. All right. Um I have GSL suppressors, this beauty right here on the end of my beautiful 22 back here. Um, shooters and sharpshooters of Augusta, our local indoor and outdoor ranges. 
PDC Custom, the most beautiful rifle chassis known to man, available in this beautiful lime green or normal human colors. Um, Shooter's World Powder keeps me uh, keeps my gun shooting better than me. That's that's for damn sure. Um, Hunter's HD Gold. I am blind as a bat, and I could actually see stuff when I wear their glasses. So if you haven't tried them, you definitely should. Uh, Fix It Six here, probably my new favorite tool um, for those of you that don't know me. Like in my personal life, I'm a total tool snob um so i got these recently and i'm absolutely in love with them and bortec because apparently you're supposed to clean your rifles from time to time paul do you have any shout outs yeah, i want to uh thank my buddy val that owns val data optics i talked to him this week he and i are like family we're we're beyond friends and uh i'm really lucky to be involved with a company that makes as good of products as, as we've been able to put together and uh, I sold a couple of scopes in the past two weeks and the customers are just, you know, they just can't, could not be happier with them. So I'm lucky to be involved with a product that is, that, that people don't just like, they love it. So um, I'm glad, glad to be associated with Valdata and selling the G2 recons. Oh, and I haven't hurt myself this way. There are no sp new scars this week. I haven't injured myself in any significant way. In nearly seven, it's been about 10 days, which for me is pretty rare. Very proud of you. Yeah. Prentice, you got any shout outs? I actually have a laundry list. I'd like to thank uh, Leopold. We're going to do the Greg Cannon thing. You need more prints. Look, it's like this. You got to, you got to, you know, if you're talking about your yeah. scope, you got to trace the it's, bottom of the scope. It's that one. Um, we got Mile High, DI Precision, JP Rifles, Manners, Stocks. We've got Voodoo Actions, MGM Targets, Steel Target Paint, Vortex Optics, Thunder Beast Suppressors, Fur Mounts, Andy Hawkins with Hawkins Precision, Planet Ford in Spring off I-45, Foundation Socks, Impact Actions, Proof Research Barrels, Magneto Speed, Kestrel, SAP, Federal Ammunition, and last but not least, Swanee Comp Gear. Woohoo, Swanee. Andy Hawkins, one of the nicest people in the business. So, we. All right. And I just want to shout out to you, Prentice, for coming and spending what, two hours of your time with a newborn baby there. I can't believe you didn't shout out to Ashley for giving you Addison. Uh, she knows, she knows how much I love Addison and her. That was a party foul right there. No, it's not. But huge shout out to y'all for coming on and spending two hours of your evening. She is so adorable. She is out like a light. Don't wake that baby up. That is a sin. You can't. You can't. <laughs> she sleeps like Prentice. She sleeps like me. She's so much cuter than you. Oh, I agree. I better hope that lasts. I hope it does. I don't know how you got a sleeper the first time. Mine was not a sleeper, but anyway. No, no, no. She's only a sleeper during the day. Once we hit about 10 o'clock, she's wide awake. It's party time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But a huge shout out to you for coming on and talking to us and sharing your match directing experience and, and all that with us. So we appreciate that. And with that, that will be a wrap for episode 337 of The Shooter's Mindset, and we will see y'all next week. Thank you.